Okay, guys. Hi, Pepper Brown here once again, and we're going to continue on with uh, important scale sequences. And uh, we download the file, important scale sequences. We're going to go to page two now. Major pentatonic scale sequences and melodic patterns. And then also minor pentatonic scale sequences and melodic patterns. So download these two, these, there's actually three pages. We're working on these two pages, page two and page three. Print them out and we can go over these together, okay? And in my website, you know, the www.pbguitarstudio.com. All right, major scale, major pentatonic scale sequences. Um, let's just use the uh, key of A here. All right, so in the key of A, we've got the major scale. Pentatonic scale is a subset, it's a five note subset. So it's one, two, three, five, six. One, two, three, five, six. One, two. So you got position one. Now, a lot of guys play it like this. wrong with that either you know you can play one fingering one three one three one three and one three one three however you want it guys however you guys want to do it um i like to do it with two four because i can overlay the major scale right on top of it and the fingering doesn't change it's one finger per fret see if you use one and three, you gotta go like this. That's extra step to think of. Okay, so we're gonna do the first scale sequences. Um, first scale sequence is on, the second page is called a 2.01, pattern number one. And it's a one, two, two, three, three, five, five, six. So you've got one, two, One, two, two, three, three, five, five, six, six, one. And then keep going. One, two, two, three, three, five, five, six, six, one, one, two. Of course, you can turn any of these into a, any type of picking exercise that you want. You can double pick each one, you know. Okay, uh, there's a lot of ways you can uh, approach it with the right hand technique. I mean, there's um, like hundreds of techniques on the right hand. And the thing about it is I'm just using a basic down up, alternate, saro, scalpel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, on this kind of thing, there's two notes on each string, so it's not ultra critical uh, which technique you use as long as you get the notes clean. hammering the second note and when you go down you pull off
So there's two ways you approach it. All right, scale sequence number two uh, from the page would be 2.02. Pattern number two, major pentatonic. Pattern going up is ascending is one, three, two, five. So one, three, two, five. And then we're gonna go three, six. And then five, one. Now I know there's a lot of guys out there who are thinking, what do you mean one, three, two, five? He's does he's not playing at the fifth fret, he's playing. What fret is he on? You know? Um, let me just clear this up real quick. What I'm talking about here are the scale tones, not the frets or the fingers. The numbers represent which note in the scale it is. And by that I mean if you have a major scale, you know, commonly, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. We're going to convert those over to numbers. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. So that's one. First note of the scale, second note of the scale, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh octave. All right, so um, when you say one, three, we're going to hit the one, first note of the scale. And if you go up the scale, the major scale, three is on the, on the next string. That's one, three is the third note of the major scale. The pentatonic scale is a major scale with some notes pulled out. They take out what? They take out the four. And they take out the seven. There's no four and seven in a, in a major pentatonic scale. It's just one, two, three, five, six. One, two, three, five, six. First note of the major scale. Second note of the major scale. Third note of the major scale. Fifth note of the major scale. Sixth note of the major scale. And back to the octave or one or first note of the major scale. So it's one, two, three, five, six is the formula for the major scale. Now, if you guys are still confused as to what that means, uh, you need to go back and backtrack and learn how to construct a major scale and learn what a major scale is. Um, everything that we do in music theory and music study is primarily based on the major scale. So if you guys don't understand the major scale, uh, you're going to have a major stumbling block right away for everything else that we're doing here. So you got to go back. You know, do not pass go, do not collect 200 bucks, go back to the beginning and start learning your major scales. So, pattern number two is one, two, one, three, two, five, three, six, five, one. One, two, right, or sorry, one, three, two, five. Descending is reverse. I flubbed the other one. And again, you can use pick and middle finger on the right hand like this to make to make it easier on you okay so that's pattern two uh, pattern three is one five two six Two six three one five two six three or yeah six three and then one five so we got
uh, pattern number four. Um, we're gonna go one six two one. So one six two one. All right, three two. to play them melodic or harmonic intervals melodic intervals would be like this harmonic intervals would be like this okay pattern number seven um, Actually, we'll do pattern number four, two dot zero five. Pattern number five is the three note pattern, one three six. So we're gonna go and go one three six two five one. So you got one three six two five one three six two five one three. Six two five and a one three six. six is one two three five so one two three five three five six one six one two three two three five six five six one two okay so we got Six. Pattern number seven is one, two, three, five, six, one. Two strings in a row. And then three, five, six, one, two, three. Now, this was 
a pattern, and I, I noticed that Larry Coriel used to use this one a lot. And also John Abercrombie used this one. More, he did more of a whole tone scale. But he used this one once in a while. But Larry Coriel for sure. Uh, Larry Coriel did it a lot more in uh, minor. And uh, this pattern is in major, so major pentatonic, A major pentatonic. So one, two, three, five, six, one. And then three, five, six, one, two, three. And then six, one, two, six, one, two, three, five, six. Say it again, six, one, two, three, five, six. One five six three. Ooh, what's that? And then three one two six. So we got one five six three. Three one. So you got kind of a wide open sound, isn't it? You know, and, you, and then of course you sarrow pick it, right? down to the uh, major scale, major pentatonic scale sequences, okay? And then the first is the four, common four note sequence, uh, one, two, three, five, two, three, five, six. So that's one, two, three, five, two, three, five, six. And then three, five, six, one. Uh, sorry, let me take that back. The first one is going to be one, two, three, five. Two, three, five, six. Yeah, yeah, you guys are saying, yeah, I thought that's what I knew. I thought it was wrong, you know. I thought he was making a mistake there. See, he's, he sucks, you know. He's no good. He's a lousy teacher, you know. He's always making mistakes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get tons of trolls on this one, I know. It's endless, the endless troll factory. Um, okay, so one, two, three, five. Two, three, five, six. Three, five, six, one. Five, six, one, two. Six, one, two, three. So that one sounds again. One, two, three, five. Two, three, five, six. Three, five, six, one. Five, six, one, two. Six, one, two, three.
can, in, within the confines of the pentatonic scale, the major pentatonic scale. Now that four note pattern is used a lot in regular seven note, three note per string patterns, you know, like. So it lends itself well to the seven note scales, but pentatonic is five notes, so you want you have to adapt it to the scale tones, which involves you pushing yourself into some areas and dimensions which may be uncomfortable at first. So I had to stop myself there. That's one, two, three, five, two, three, five, six, three, five, six, one. Right? So that's that scale sequence. So that's the four note sequence. A uh, three note sequence. One, two, three, two, three, five. One, two, three, two, three, five. How's that work? One, two, three, two, three, five. sequence number one or number two actually next one is a triplet pattern ascending 2.13 it's called one two one so we're going one two one two three two that's a popular one right That's uh, triplet pattern number one, two dot thirteen. Now two dot fourteen is a three note arpeggio sequence. So we're gonna go one three five, two five six, three five three, five six five. So you got one two one. Five six five six one six. Oh, five six five was like supposed to be like this. Six one six. Back to one two one. So that's a little strange when you got to sort of work that out a little bit. Um, the next one is a three note arpeggio sequence number two, 2.15. We got 153, 615. Uh, a little strange sequence, huh? Two, 
6. strange one anyway um three one five okay um four note pentatonic scale uh first one is one three five six one six five three so one three five six one six five three Six one and then two one six five. So you got two five six one two one six five. And it goes three six one two and three two one six. Five one two three and five three two one. And six two three five. And a six five three two. Three, five, six. So this is some really oddball ones, you know, to go through. Uh, major pentatonic scale sequences. Uh, you can probably scratch the last two to practice. They're really strange ones. I've I worked them out so long ago, I've forgotten how strange they are. But the, the ones you want to practice are the basic sequences, like one, two, two, three, three, five, five. three note sequence and then a four note sequence okay and then uh, the major pentatonic scale sounds different than the minor pentatonic scale you use it over major seventh chords major six chords major nine major six nine major six nine Plus 11, you can also use it over dominant chords. You can use it over an A7, A6, A11. Okay, now let's talk about the as a one chord. It'd be one major, major, one major seven, one major six, one major nine. Okay, and then as a uh, like a dominant chord, you have a one. A A7, A6, A11, A9, more popularly. Okay, so that's it for the major pentatonic scale sequences. These are the most popular ones. Um, we're going to go on now. The next page, minor pentatonic positions, minor pentatonic.
Okay, Rob, we're going to talk a little bit about the minor pentatonic sequences now. Okay, moving on, we're going to talk about here, uh, go to the third page, uh, major, major pentatonic sequences, and then we're going to go to the third page, which is minor pentatonic sequences. Now, I, a lot of you guys are going to probably really... Uh, be able to use lots of these because you guys play in minor pentatonic scales all the time. So this is this page that has probably the most popular sequences on it. And uh, you can definitely use all these in any rock song, metal song, anything you want in pentatonic scales. And I'm going to show you a couple ways you can do it. All right, so the first one is 3.01. Pattern number one, minor pentatonic. Ascending is one flat three, Flat three, four, four, five, five, flat seven, flat seven, one. Now I want to play this one in uh, G. And uh, I get asked a lot, why, you know, why do I do everything in G? Why is everything in G? Well, I don't want to do a C, A, whatever you want. But uh, for the purpose of videos, why I pick G is because G frames up in a video frame real easily to see. Either if I did it in... D up here, I'd have to move 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 over here, right? You have to calculate where you're gonna be in the video. So G is always really easy for you guys to see, you know what I'm saying? That's why I do G a lot because of the videos, it frames up real nice. Uh you know, you you can play in any key you want to, you know. But G is a pretty pretty normal for a lot of music, so and I figured G is easy, it's only got one sharp in the in the key signature, so you guys could work with it a little bit easier. And then, of course, you'd want to transpose them to all 12 keys when you get the time. You just sit down and just work it all out. Okay, so the first one, 3.01. Ascending is 1. Now I'm going to use a little more of an overdrive tone because it's minor pentatonic, and you guys can hear what it sounds like better. So 1, flat 3, flat 3, 4, uh, 4, 5. Okay, five flat seven, flat seven one. So what we got is and back down. I use pull offs. Extend that out into a longer pentatonic scale. Same pattern. Pattern number two, ascending, it'd be one, four, flat three, five, four, flat seven, five, one. Pattern number two, and on this page, of course, there's typos. This is 3.03. We've got 3.01, 3.03, and then two 3.04s in a row. So if you guys email me about the typo, I know. Uh, if you want, I could just stop making the video right now and then shut everything down and go over and fix it and come back tomorrow, but I'll try to get this video done tonight. So anyway, so we got 3.01, 3.03, 3.04, and 3.04. <laughs> uh, I think I did that in honor of uh, on the corner of Town and Arrow in Pomona. Uh, one brief period of about six months on one corner was an Arco station and uh, on the opposite corner 
was another brand of gas. And uh, it was a smaller gas company that was a, sort of an unknown brand. And they went out of business because Arco, you know, BP is mighty. So everybody went to Arco. And that other gas station went out of business, right? So Arco bought the other gas station. They bought the property. And uh, after they bought it, they put in another Arco station. So there was a, one corner there was an Arco station. And across the street, the other corner, there was an Arco station. And people who hadn't seen it before were like, what? what? That, there's an Arco station? Then there's a cross street? There's another Arco station? We're like, yeah, man. We like Arco. It's cool. But anyway, now it's an Arco, and, an, and the, the next uh, the gas station that's across the street is a Thrifty, which is owned also by BP. So it's still Arco. <laughs> so that's this is in honor of that, okay? 3.04 twice in a row. Just so you guys know that that's in honor of the two Arco stations on the corner of Town Avenue and Arrow Highway in Pomona, California. And we'll always remember that this way. All right. The first 3.04. Ascending pattern, 1.5, flat 3, 7. 4, 1, 5, flat 3. So we got 1.5. Flat three seven, or flat three flat seven, I should say. Okay, and then we got what? One, one five flat three flat seven four one five flat three flat seven four. So we got. So you take these little angular sounding patterns like start a lick with one of those and then end the lick with a familiar you know kind of rock lick or whatever uh, or do it the other way around do a rock lick and then end it with an angular sounding pattern like different sort of creative ideas that way, huh? So you got... Alright, then you can extend it up a little longer. You can also do is uh, what I like is the sarod picking on that, which sounds really cool. Like Okay, and the 
other way. Are we going down? So we go. West Coast Jazz Rock Fusion. When I say West Coast Jazz Rock Fusion, some of you guys don't, don't know really what that means, but to me it means all the past 30 years these guys who jam over at the Baked Potato. You know, there's been tons of great guys. Scott Henderson, Mike Landau, you know, of course Holdsworth goes there and plays in the Frank Gambali all the time. Uh, it used to be this guy that played in uh, uh, sort of a Christian-based fusion group called Hadley Hawkinsmith. And he had just this great tone. He was a great guitar player. But I think he went off and did just Christian music after that. But anyway, uh, the Baked Potato has been a nightclub in L.A. for decades. And it's a very small room. And amazing guitar players have gone through there. The best. You know. And the thing about the Baked Potato is, though, it's such a small club. It's like holds maybe 100 people. <laughs> and you got guys like Larry Carlton playing there. And you got Lee Rittenauer playing there, uh, Stanley Clark playing there, Chick Corea will jam there, you know. And what they do is uh, on the marquee, they uh, they try to uh, create like a diversion. Like one time, Steve Lukather played there for the guitars from Toto, and so uh, the marquee said uh, Los Lobotomies was the name of his band. So they they put stuff up like that, and if you drive by and you see something like that, you know, oh. It's got to be somebody intense tonight, you know. Uh, one time, uh, it was a Larry Larry Carlton played there with uh, his band, and he had uh, an all-star lineup, including Abe Laboriel on bass and everybody. And the band was billed as like the Greg Schwartzman band, you know, on the marquee. So you look at the marquee, and it says Greg Schwartzman. And anybody who knows anything about the pit, but baked potato just goes... Oh, we gotta go tonight. We gotta check that out. Who we gotta see who it is, you know? Because you know it's like somebody radical, you know. And uh, one time Stanley Clark played there, and the marquee said something like, you know, Frank Franklonk Band. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you drive by and you see Frank Franklonk Band, and you go, we gotta go tonight, man. We gotta see who that is. We get we get there and there's a huge line outside anyway. And you get in there and it's Stanley Clark, you know, jamming with Jean-Luc Ponty and Alan Holdsworth, you know. Chick Corea on keyboards, you know. Dennis Chambers on drums. You know, that, that's the kind of club it is. You know, you know, those kind of guys, you know. That's the Frank Franklonk band, you know. Anyway, uh, so by West Coast Fusion, I mean all these guys that are on the West Coast. Uh, I'm, I'm using this guitar in honor of that, you know, kind of style. Lee Rittenauer, Larry Carlton, uh, Robin Ford used to play... Uh, uh, 335 all the time. Actually, when he was starting out, he played more of a big hollow body w with distortion, which was interesting because it was a big old hollow body like a Birdland or something, and he played with like some sustain on it, which was like, whoa, you know, <laughs> cool. <laughs> a little too much feedback, you know. Don't tell Ted Nugent that. He plays those big Birdlands for the feedback. But anyway, uh, what we got here is a pattern 3.04, the first one in honor of the Arco Station. Uh, one five flat three seven. So you take that pattern and you can, you know, double pick it with sarod picking or scalpel picking or alternate picking or whatever you want. Uh, and then add a lick at the end, right? So we got one five, flat three, flat seven, uh, flat three, flat seven. There's the flat seven. One five, 
flat three, flat seven, four one, five flat three, flat seven four, one five. Okay, uh, a little tangent here. A lot of guys are always asking me about the tone on this. My 335, what, you know, how are you getting that tone out of that thing? Okay, uh, here's the trick. It's real easy. Uh, you got some gain on your amp, right? The toggle switch is all the way down the tr for the treble pickup, right? All the way down. Here's what it sounds like with just a treble pickup. A little bit too bitey, right? Here's what it sounds like uh, with a rhythm pickup. Uh, sort of ballsy, sort of bluesy, sort of tuby sound uh, in the middle. But it's it's kind of fat in the middle. Kind of like. A little too mid rangey. So the trick is you put it in the middle and you turn the treble pickup all the way on 10, and then the, the rhythm pickup, you turn it down to about maybe three or four and adjust it by ear. So here's a three. So that treble pickup covers up the rhythm pickup. So I'm gonna dial in the rhythm pickup on this note. See, it has that bassiness to it. That's by adding just the pickup gain. So I put the rhythm pickup on about three or four or five, maybe. There's about five and a half. So you still get that treble. But that rhythm pickup fattens it up a little bit. As opposed to just a treble pickup. Here's both. A little more rhythm pickup. pickup all the way up and the rhythm pickup you put it on about five or six or seven whatever you like and then you can experiment around you can do the other way too you can turn the rhythm pickup all the way up and the treble pickup down and then bring the treble pickup up to your taste you know You know, a lot of those guys that play 335s would get that kind of a tone out of it. And uh, you can do the same thing on a Les Paul. I'm just uh, more of a guy who likes 335s than I do Les Pauls. I think I kind of grew up around, you know, Southern California. And uh, when I was a student at Dick Grove, uh, you know, the big guys who played at the Baked Potato, which was right down the block from Dick Grove, you know, Larry Carlton, Lee Rittenauer, Robin Ford, Hadley Hawkins Smith, Mike Landau. Well, Mike Landau played a Strat all the time, but all those other guys played 335s all the time. And uh, Larry Carlton was known as Mr. 335. He had a song called Room 335. And so, you know, the 335 is like the backbone of L.A. Jay Graydon is another L.A. studio cat who played 335s all the time. And of course, one of my instructors, Ted Green, he had a dozen, th 
five dozen 335s, all with crazy ass pickup modifications and crazy stuff. But you know, the 335 is like you know, the LA West Coast studio guitar, man. Uh, if you go into a session with a 335, you can play rock, you can play jazz, you can play blues on it. So they're really versatile guitars. Although in the 80s and 90s when uh, hair bands took over and the tapping metal guys started playing a lot, they sort of faded away in favor of more Strat, Strat guitars, you know. A lot of studio cats would play Strats, you know. Uh, and then they started modifying the Strats and put humbuckers in them, you know. I know Randall Chrisman put a, put a bunch of Tom Johnson pickups in his Strat, you know. And, uh, there's a lot of studio cats in L.A. That's, that play Strats and... Um, I know Eric Johnson likes to play 335, so I've seen a lot of clips of Eric Johnson playing 335s. But anyway, um, so the tone is is, is uh, something you got to craft on your own with your own amp, your own ears, your own taste, you know, your own pedals, whatever you're going to do. But I like to... I like, I like to put it in the middle pickup with the rhythm pickup rolled all the way off and then gradually roll it on to add that bassiness to it. first one still so we're going and you can do that in a long pattern Now, next one is a th the second 3.04 in honor of the Arco station. Uh, one flat seven, flat three. Mm, what's that? One flat seven, flat three. Then one, one flat seven, flat three, one. Excuse me. One flat seven, flat three, one. Or you can do it like this. It's probably the second one. Yeah, the second one is one flat seven, flat three, one. Now that one is a weird sounding one because of the interval sounds are strange. Like you got a flat seven here, you got a minor seven, major six, minor seven, minor seven. What is that? Major seven? No, that's a six. Flat seven, minor seven. As the intervals on their own, they're hideous, aren't they? But in a solo, you play them separate. Different stuff, huh? Okay, so that's that's a picket sequence number 3.04, second one. 3.05, okay, we're back to normal now. 1, 4, flat 7. What do we got there? Okay, now this sequence was taught to me none other by none other than Robin Ford himself. Uh, he was teaching a seminar class at Dick Grove one day, and uh, he had all these handouts on how to tweak pentatonic scales and this is the this is one of the ones that he sat down with us and tried to get us to play and we didn't like it at first but you know of course he 
made it sound really bitching. And so, you know, you kind of listen to how he did it and you go, holy shit, man, this is great, you know. So then that, you know, you, you stick with it and you try it, but it's like this. Now, Frank Gambale does that one a lot with his directional sweep picking. He's the best at it. I suck at it. He does four at a time, too. Three, three notes across. Now, Danny Gatton liked this one too because because you could use a pick and these two fingers, right? So you go pick two three, right? So you go like Two techniques there, all right. The next one is, of course, my own that's sarrowed, you know. And of course, I've seen Eric Johnson do this one like this. He does all downstrokes. But he does but I prefer sarrowed, you know. Okay, next one, 3.07. <laughs> no 3.06, right? God, this sheet's got typos all over it, doesn't it? Man, when did I write this? I don't know, the copyright's this year, so it can't be true. It can't, it can't be true. It's got to be really old, because I would have caught these typos that I'd done this, this year. Anyway, uh, well, let's call this 3.06. Pattern number six. That's that's our saving grace. That's our redeemer. It says pattern number six. Ascending one flat three four five four five flat seven one. So one flat three four five one flat three four five and then four five flat seven one and then flat seven one flat three. Flat seven one flat three four. So you're just doing this. Some guys would call those coils or whatever. These are all just scale sequences and scale patterns, man. These are the most common and popular ones for the minor pentatonic scale. There's plenty more than this, trust me, and I'll do some more videos on that later, but I just want to give you guys the main sheet so you can start working on these for now because, uh, you know, you really get a lot of use out of them, you know. You really will if you work them, okay? Uh, so this one is uh, pattern number six. <laughs> I like I like that. Experiment the, the way you want to, you know, do it however you want. All right, then uh, 
Pattern number seven, three dot zero seven. Pattern number seven, one flat three four five flat seven one. And we call that the Larry Coriel pattern. That's like three strings, and the next three strings, next three strings, and then. So we got. And of course, I like to, of course, you know. Okay, then we got a uh, pattern number eight ascending one five flat seven four. Hmm. Eric Johnson style, huh? It's sort of a wide, wide open, wide open sound, isn't it? Like, uh, just to insert, inter insert a little concept here is uh, a lot of guys uh, who are into fast playing don't realize that uh, there's two kinds of fast playing. There's the kind that uh, what I call adjacent scale tone soloing, which is what almost all the metal guys do. And then I, there's the other kind, which is non-adjacent scale tone soloing, which is guys like Eric Johnson and McLaughlin and Holdsworth and all the really, really, really advanced players do non-adjacent scale tone soloing. Uh, fast, right? Uh, adjacent scale tone soloing uh, is playing notes that are right next to each other in the scale, like this. So a fast adjacent scale tone rip would be... So that's adjacent, the notes are next to each other in the scale, you know, it's really easy. It's really easy to play fast that way. And so everybody does that. And, you know, they call it shredding, whatever you want to call it, ripping, shredding, playing fast. Um, but then guys like uh, Eric Johnson come along. Like, Notes that aren't aren't next to each other in the scale, which is way harder to do because you got to jump around more, and that's the kind of stuff that more advanced players get attracted to because it's, they they hear and they, it's interesting, you know, sounding. It doesn't sound just you know. All that kind of stuff is fast, but it's not interesting to musicians because it's they can hear the tones that are just next to each other like a blur. That's like. Okay, you know, when's he going to play some melody line out of it? You know, there used to be this joke about Al Demiola playing all the time back in the old days when he used to play this lick. You would take that lick and go up. And on the record, people were just going, ooh, ah, but when you watch him play live, he's just doing this with his hands right there. And you realize... He's just doing adjacent scale tone soloing and taking it up half step at a time. Well, the modern day equivalent of that, you know, of course, is everybody's favorite guy, right? Paul Gilbert, right? Okay, you know, everybody's gonna slam me on putting down Paul Gilbert. I'm not putting him down. I'm saying that's just the same as the Alda Miola thing. Is Alda Miola's up here? And Paul Gilbert's down here. And everybody's gonna everybody's gonna troll me and say, "Oh, Paul Gilbert, man, he could slam you so hard, man. He he could play circles around you, man. He could shred you so bad, man. You even bring him up. You know, you're not worthy of even saying his name and stuff." Well, let me tell you something, folks. You know, Paul Gilbert. I could I could play faster than Paul Gilbert on the 10 freeway. If we do that 10 freeway contest, I guarantee you I could beat Paul Gilbert from Santa Monica out to San Bernardino. You know it and I know it. The only guy who could 
The only guy I can't beat who can make it from Santa Monica to San Bernardino is Gil Sandoval. And everybody knows that. He's the fastest there is on the 10 freeway. So anybody who thinks Paul Gilbert's faster than me, you guys meet me down in Santa Monica and we'll set, we'll set a race up between me and him so you can make it out to San Bernardino starting at 4 o'clock. See who gets there first, huh? Paul, if you're watching this, I know you know it and I know it. So the 10 freeway, pal, that's the true test of speed. Anyway. Some people are going to think that's serious, right? I don't know. I'm not being serious. I'm not being serious, man. It's just a joke. It's just a, it's just a gag. It's not a rip or anything. You know, we love Paul Gilbert. I like Paul Gilbert. I like, I really like his playing. I, I think he's fantastic, brilliant, great comedy, great, great humor in his in his attitude as well. And I, everything he does, I like. You know, so don't get me wrong. I think he's wonderful. Okay, believe me, I really like his stuff. Okay. Um, I, I just get, I just get the Paul Gilbert grind all the time because of, you know, I guess our mutual student causes a great deal of argument. <laughs> anyway, uh, here we are, pattern number eight, one, five, flat seven, four, and that's what I'm talking about. Non-adjacent scale tone sound. That's like an Eric Johnson sound. So we got one five flat seven four. Four one flat three flat seven. Four one flat three flat seven. Now I like that one. You can also do uh, an extension of that by doing that riff and moving up to the next position in the pentatonic patterns and then move up to the next position in the pentatonic patterns and then move once again up to the very next position in the pentatonic patterns and then once again move up to the very next position in the pentatonic patterns, right? So we go like this. ideas doing stuff this way okay anyway that's pattern number eight one five flat seven four four one flat three flat seven four one flat three flat seven and then flat seven four five flat three and you know me I love to Sarah dig it Okay, descending. One, flat seven, three, one. Now that's not, it's. You can just use that little thing like Okay, so one, flat seven, flat three, one. Five, four, flat seven, five. Flat three, one, four, flat three.
Different stuff than you guys are used to, huh? It's a different pentatonic stuff. Well, this is all like L.A. fusion jazz guitarist patterns. You know, half of these are from Robin Ford. Uh, some of these are... There's a lot of guys doing these out in L.A. back in the 70s. Uh, there was a ton of guys at Dick Grove who were coming up with stuff like this that I probably either stole or made up or invented or got by reverse osmosis or... Half of these ideas I got are stolen from my pal Byron Fry. You know, Byron, I'm sorry, but I can't even remember if they're your ideas or my ideas half the time. We we used to sit and come up with the most crazy stuff day after day. You know, we'd sit in his living room and try to come up with the most hideous exercises on the guitar we could possibly do. And I think the reason for that was because uh, back when we were at Dick Grove, we had like the underdog thing going on because Berkeley College of Music was well known. And Howard Roberts was getting GIT off the ground well, and everybody was going to GIT. But Dig Grove wasn't as known as those other places. So we kind of felt like we were like the elite secret guitar school. And we had Russ Tuttle, and we had uh, Robin Ford, and we had Jody Orio, and we had uh, Ted Green, and we had, you know, a handful of guys, Mundell Lowe. Uh, he had guys come in and teach classes uh, on weekends, these long, long seminars. And you know, and we'd take private lessons from him on the side after we met him, you know, and so we thought that Dick Grove was like the really secret underground cult guitar school, so Byron and I would sit there and try to come up with just, just amazing hideous exercises, you know, and I, I remember one night, crashed out on his couch in the living room, uh, I came up with the spider exercises when I woke up because there was a spider crawling on the wall and I was looking at it just going... I wonder if your fingers could do that, man. And I'm like, whoa, man. Ooh. And then later, hey, Byron, look, look at this, man. And you go, oh, that's hideous, man. Let me see that. Let me try that. And he would try it. Well, try it like this, you know. Oh, no, wait. Try it like this. So all these exercises, really, that was the gel pool back then. And, you know, I just worked it out on paper and taught people for 33 years how to do it. So... I don't know if they're 100% original. Some probably about, probably about most of them are. I don't know. You know, these are exercises, man. These are scale sequences, man. You can't copyright scale sequences, man. You can't copyright exercises, man. You just do the exercises and you get good, man. You make your songs. You make your records. You know, go tour. You guys send me send me an email from the tour, man. That's what I'm concerned with. Don't be trolling me and telling me that you know these are somebody else's ideas, man. I want to hear from you on your tour when you're telling me you're playing in front of a big audience in some big arena, man. That's the goal. All right. Pattern number eight. One five flat seven four. All right, and then four one flat three flat seven. Flat seven four five three. All right, and coming down. All right, so those are the sort of the intervallic, some of the intervallic scale sequences. And I tell you, there's a couple of guys who have these things, uh, these 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 intervallic uh, patterns, like crazy. If you want to go further into this, you know, you got to get two books. You got to get uh, 21st Century Intervallic Patterns by Joe DiOrio, and then. Uh, Probably uh, Artful Arpeggios by Don Mock. Now, Mock was a guy at GIT who was just an insane interval player, man. Radical, 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 scary, scary guy, you know? And, uh, you know, I think he's still around there. I don't know. Anyway, back to this, we're going to go to 3.10. All right? 3.10. Four note sequence number one. 3.11, four note sequence number one. All right, one flat three, four, five, flat three, four, five, flat seven, four, five, flat seven, one, five, flat seven, one, flat three, flat seven, one, flat three, four. Now you should be reading this off the paper with me, not just watching this video, because when you hear me say it, it sounds weird. When you, when you read it and you try to play, you can figure it out. <coughs> Take a little feedback, huh? Take a little break here. We're gonna. Okay, 
man. You guys want to know what it is? I'll tell you right now. Trader Joe's green. Trader Joe's green tea. No sugar. Anyway. Uh, 3.11. Sorry about that. 3.11. Four note sequence number one. One, flat three, four, five. Flat three, four, five, flat seven. Four, five, flat seven, one. So the pattern goes. extend that really easily with this one it's a real even pattern so what I'd like to do is uh, combine position one and position two together and you can go like this and then, and then jump back to position one and then straight you know really you know just go slow go smooth you know no don't glitch it by trying to play too fast the speed will come after I like, play playing it for a half hour you know <laughs> Take it into three patterns like this. extend out the pattern uh, by going into the next position see so we got <laughs> pattern okay now you know me I like to serrow pick it right so... so you get the idea there 
there, okay. Practices, practices all over the neck, okay. I'm using G, and as I explained before, G is because it frames up good in a video, you know. You don't have to play in G, you can play in any key you want to. I just had to use G because where that, I can use A or G, it frames up much better in a video to be right here on the neck than it is, you know, up here somewhere, and you gotta sit back here, you know. That's the reason we use G all the time in video, okay. All right, three dot, boy, I'm doing fantastic on the C. There's a three dot 11, but no three dot 12, but there's a three dot 13. Three dot 13, three no sequence number one. Somebody help me with all these typos, man. You know, what was I thinking, you know? Shit, you know, I don't know. I mean, is this whole page supposed to be in honor of the two Arco stations? One across the street from each other. I guess I guess we'll dedicate this minor pentatonic page to the two Arco stations in Pomona. So this is a tribute page. The minor pentatonic scale sequence sheet is a tribute page to the two Arco stations in Pomona, California on Arrow and Town Avenue. So let, let's have a moment of silence and commemorate that. Anyway, 3.13. One flat three four. Flat three four flat three four five. Oh hey, this seems like a three note sequence, huh? Okay. Four five flat seven. Yeah. Five flat seven one. Flat seven, one flat three. One flat three, four. So we got. Fourteen, triplet pattern number one. One flat three one, flat three four flat three. One flat three one, flat three four flat three. Four five four, five flat seven five. Flat seven one flat seven. basic patterns for a lot of rock players and you hear them a lot on records so you should really learn these you should really get these down because they're like they're like you know textbook patterns you know that most all rock players have under their belt all right so then 3.14 twice again here we go i'm doing so good on this one four five flat three five flat seven One four five flat three five flat seven 
four, flat seven, one, five, one, flat three, flat seven, flat three, four, one, four, five. So you get the idea there. That's an interesting pattern, huh? All right, number three dot fifteen, ascending one five four, flat seven one five. pentatonic scale sequence one four five flat seven and then one flat seven five four and then flat three five flat seven one Flat three, one, flat seven, figure out which notes you want to use in these patterns you know there's plenty more patterns uh, the last two on this page are a little a little out there but if you work them enough you can use them in some strange ideas you may want to do later or whatever you want to do but anyway um, take these major pentatonics minor pentatonics and these sequences and work them in all five patterns and then I'd Sarah would pick them and then I'd jump around and try playing them and backwards and forwards and stuff it's a lot of practice, but uh, really the pentatonic scales are really where it's at for rock music. And a lot of jazz guys use pentatonic scales too, fusion guys do. So it's really to your advantage to learn some of these patterns. They're very, very, very popular among rock guitarists. So that's as far as I want to go today with this lesson with the patterns. And now we want to move on into uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, playing around the circle of fifths. So hang in there for the next video. We're going to talk about the circle of fifths. <laughs> 